You're listening to The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken Brown. Jesus talks about it. He talks about it being eternal. He talks about it. There's 12 times in the New Testament he talked that hell's talked about. Jesus talks about it 11 times. He warned us more of hell than anyone else in the New Testament. And for the believer, the one who chooses not to follow the beast, yeah, you won't be able to buy food. You'll, you'll be actively hunted. You'll be placed in concentration camps. You'll be killed. But you'll spend eternity with Christ. The choice to follow Jesus is an eternal decision. Think about that word for a second, eternal. It means to last or exist forever. You have the choice to either last forever in heaven or in hell. But luckily, there is nothing you have to do to earn your way into heaven. The only thing you must do is believe in Jesus, and He can save you by His grace through your faith. Following Jesus doesn't make your life easy, but it is worth it. Today, Pastor Ken will remind you that you have an eternity in heaven to look forward to. Well, let's join Pastor Ken in the book of Zephaniah, chapter 3, as he continues his message. Now for a word from our sponsor. Zephaniah 3, chapter 3, verse 13. The remnant of Israel will do no wrong and tell no lies. There you go. Nor will a deceitful tongue be found in their mouths. This is the first of that group, the 144,000. They are a answer to that prophecy from Zephaniah. They will feed and lie down with no one to make them tremble. God's going to take care of them. So this large number have been kept utterly clean during the, the tribulation. And they're the first fruits of those. There are others. This is just the evangelists who were marked by the Lord. Now, Moving on in chapter 14, we're going to see that there's some angels that are going to give us some words. Now, every time I use the word angel, everybody starts thinking, oh, yeah, guy with wings. Okay, angel is a job description, okay? It means messenger. Does not necessarily mean he has wings. Remember, when in the Old Testament we saw that some of them were snake-like, they were called seraphim. We had cherubim, who are not naked flying babies but are multidimensional with four faces, and you don't want to cross them. We also see that there's the angel of the Lord, who is the pre-incarnate Christ, who one evening uh, after dinner killed 144,000 folks who were around the nation of uh, Israel, specifically Jerusalem, and they all went home. The Assyrians did as a result of it. So this is a job description, angel, messenger, okay? So John is going to show us three messengers, who are literally performing that duty. We're going to meet six of them, actually. Each has a distinctive, specific meaning. We're going to get three of them. Verses 6 and 7 of chapter 14. And I saw another angel. And I like how John has seen so many angels at this point. He just wants you to know, it's not anyone I've seen yet, okay? I don't know their names. They're not wearing name types. Hi, my name's Isaac. They, we don't know who they are, okay? He's just saying, I saw another one who's like all the others, but not the same. Okay, it's, a, it's another angel, a different guy. This one's got red hair. The other one had, yeah, we don't know. But he has an, he's flying around in mid-heaven. Now we talked about that a couple of weeks ago, that there were three heavens. The first heaven, which is around earth. The mid-heaven, which is above that. And then the third heaven, which is where the Lord lives, based on the, the way that the Jew would understand cosmology. This angel is in mid-heaven. So he can't be reached by Satan and his minions. It's basically, he's flying around doing that while he's, uh, not really, but I mean, you feel like he might be. They can't get there to him. They can't stop him. And he's flying around in mid-heaven having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth. There's that operative word, live on the earth. And to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And he said with a loud voice, fear God, give him glory. Because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, the springs, and the springs of water. Now, does God do that right now? He uses us, doesn't he? He relies on weak people, subject to sinning, subject to failing, 
that have to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to be able to communicate that message. And he has done a marvelous job using us to reach the world. But at this point in the tribulation, the 144,000 no longer have access to television. They no longer have access to radio. They probably are now down to one-on-one evangelism. That's all that's left. And if the population of the planet is just a little bit around 2 to 3 billion, that means each one of the 144,000 has a personal group that they have to reach of about 15,000 people. So that's a large group. They're going to be busy. But it makes you wonder, why couldn't God done that from the beginning? Just have an angel circle around and say, hey, you know, accept, accept me or else. Now, Dr. Ryrie sees that, and he, he, he says, oh, the only reason this is happening because the hundred, he says the 144,000 have been removed from planet Earth and they're with the, with the Lord. I don't see that. I think we went forward and we went backwards. So this is not the only way they can get the message is angels. But what we've seen throughout the scriptures is that when there's an extraordinary situation that takes place, God at times will do extraordinary things to communicate his message. For example, an elderly gentleman walking through his field, taking care of his sheep, and he sees a bush burning that doesn't burn up. And he goes and he finds out that that bush talks to him. Okay, that's a little different. A guy who's treading out grapes in a, in a place where you're not supposed to be treading out grapes, you're supposed to be doing wheat there, or no, he's doing wheat where you're doing the grapes, okay? His name's Gideon. And the, whole, and, and the Spirit of the Lord shows up and talks to him. God does this over and over and over again. By the way, he's doing that today, too. There is a group of people today that are very hard to reach with the, with the gospel. I mean, not that we're tr- not trying. We, we're doing radio. We're doing internet. They're blocking internet. They're blocking radio. I've been in one of the countries there, and they actively block the radio frequency that uh, trans world radio uses to try and communicate the gospel in Arabic into that nation. So what's God doing since it seems like everything that we try to do gets stopped? In the book Dreams and Visions, which talks about the fact that Jesus is currently using dreams, visions, and anything possible to reach Muslims because nothing else is working. We get a hint of what's going to be going on during the tribulation, I think. About a decade ago, this is a group from folks who work with Muslim outreach, They said they started to hear something new in the world of Islam. God was opening the closed hearts of Muslims by giving them spectacular dreams and visions. At first, the stories were rare. But today, the amazing accounts of God breaking through to Muslims has become a common occurrence. We have found that one out of every three Muslim background believers has had a dream or a vision prior to their salvation experience. Some are more precise and a bit more conservative, but somewhere between 25% to 35% of Muslims who are coming to Christ see a vision of Jesus Christ first. And then they try to find out who he is from that point. And this is what it's going to be like during the tribulation. I mean, we've got a group of people that can't be reached right now, yet God's reaching them. What's the penalty for giving your life to Christ if you're in Saudi Arabia? Death. You know, you get your head cut off. Oh, gee, isn't that interesting? That's what it says in Revelation. Okay, anyway. um, Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 29 says this. It will come about after this that I'll pour out my spirit on all mankind. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants, I'll pour out my spirit in those days. I think God's going to do, because of his grace, anything that's possible to try and reach the earth dwellers on planet Earth, but we'll also see with these angel messages that there is a line, there is a bright line that's drawn in the sand, that once you cross this line, it's over with. It's done. Today we would call it the unpardonable sin, rejection of the, of the wooing of the Holy Spirit to the point that God just says, I'm done with you. I'll give you exactly what you want. You don't want me, I don't want you. And the classic example is when Herod's trying to talk to Jesus and Jesus doesn't answer him. When God doesn't want to talk to you, whoa. You've crossed a line somewhere. But here in Revelation 14, 7, we have this angel who's flying around mid-heaven, out of reach, 
<laughs> I think that's funny. It's out of reach. It's, again, it's kind of like, yeah, you can't come here, but I can talk to you. And he's obviously broadcasting to the entire planet with the eternal gospel message, and he's doing so with every language known. He is achieving what Wycliffe Bible translators has tried to achieve, and he's going to do it in one, in one swoop around the world. He's going to be able to tell everybody about Jesus in their language, no matter where they are. And he's going to say, fear God, give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. I, I find that interesting. He has to remind them, God made all this. Reminder, reminder. But the only way earth dwellers can now hear is supernatural. I mean, this is last call. Literally, last call. Before God pours out his seven bowls of judgment, he gives everyone one last opportunity. He has an angel that has been practicing in projection, on projection of voice for centuries. He's probably pretty good at it. And he's going to tell them that what needs to happen is all you have to do is fear or reverence God, worship him, and give glory to the creator. That's it. Come and accept Christ. One more time, the good news is being communicated. One more time. And even the things that are mentioned are significant. Heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of water. The reminder is intentional, and so are those items are intentional. Before God pours out his judgment, he reminds them, I made it. And since I made it, I'm also free to use whatever I need to from it for judgment. The first four bowl judgments, which will impact the earth, they'll impact the earth, the sea, the springs of water, and the heavens. Everything that he says, I'm the creator of, the first four bowl judgments will impact. I find that intriguing. Even though there are 144,000 evangelists out there, the technology and the surveillance economy created by the false prophet has stopped the communication of the gospel. The only thing God can do now is communicate with an angel. And by the way, if you're on planet Earth at this point in time, and you're listening to this, it's not like you haven't heard, okay? Uh, really, not only have you had access to all the Bibles and Christian literature that were left behind when we got out of here, now, if you've got my Bible, I've marked everything in yellow that you're supposed to read, okay? If you haven't, tough. It's on you. But you've also heard the testimony of, of two guys who have been killed and taken out, Enoch and Elijah, probably. You've had all these divine judgments. You've heard and seen angels fly through the air, and you've had everybody on the planet and the universe all of a sudden drop to their knees and say, Jesus is Lord. And you don't know? Give me a break. You've just seen people tortured by demons for five months who want to die and can't die, and over a billion have been murdered by demons, and now Satan and his gang are on earth, and you're kind of like, really? I still don't believe? But one more time, God's grace is going to go out to the planet. One more time. And it's about to become too late. And I said, so far the rocks have remained silent. Remember Jesus said back in Luke 19, verses 39 and 40, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And Jesus said, I tell you, if they become silent, the stones will cry out. That's wrong. The stones did cry out. Back in Revelation 5, 13. Every created thing which is in heaven, on the earth, and under the earth, and on the sea, and all in them, I heard saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing, honor, and glory, and dominion forever and ever. The rocks cried out. It says every created thing. Anything God made is giving God glory. <sighs> what can I say? and there's more to come. But the one thing God wants to communicate to everybody still around at that point in time is real simple. He talk, Jesus talked about it in John 3, 16 to 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the son to the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And then we have another angel, second angel. Verse 8, and another angel, a second one, followed, saying, 
fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who has made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her, of her immorality. This is encouragement again for believers, those who have been in hiding and hoping to survive the next three and a half years. The world system, which we see in the scriptures as a battle between Jerusalem and Babylon, that world system is going to go down. Its doom is coming. We'll get more to it when we get to chapter 16, but its doom is coming. Everyone who has rejected the message of the first angel, there's a message from the second angel. Judgment is coming. Your world system is going to go down. It's absolutely going to go down. And by the way, make no mistake, it is Babel or Babylon. There are many who think Babylon will be rebuilt. Saddam Hussein actually started rebuilding it. It is a United Nations World Heritage Site. And the United Nations is even talking about moving its headquarters there. So, I don't know. I just find that, I find that, that all very interesting. Okay, so we come to the third angel, verses 9 to 11. Then another angel, a third one, followed him, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead, remember, mark is like a stamp or a bite, on his forehead or on his hand, he will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day and night, those who worship the beast, his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. May God have blessing on his word. Recall back in verse 17 of chapter 13, it says that if you don't have this mark, you can't buy or sell. So the false prophet said, if you want to buy and sell and participate economically in this culture, you're going to have to have this mark. And what God is saying is, you take that mark, that's fine. You'll be able to buy and sell for three and a half years. And then you'll spend eternity wishing you hadn't done that. He talks about the fact that the smoke and torment goes up forever and ever. I mean, we're learning a little bit about hell from this angel. The word, by the way, that's used for wrath is the Greek word thumoi, which talks about this as being a, a passionate state of intense displeasure. This is something that just didn't happen. This is not just somebody reacting. This is somebody spending years getting to that point. Dr. Mounts puts it very well. The word refers to anger that is passionate and vehement. It's poured full strength in the cup of his wrath. Literally mean mixed by adding different spices to make it even stronger, using the Greek words there. So for those with the mark, if you got the mark, it's too late. You're done. The third angel gives the message of impending judgment. It's about the political world system, but he also makes it very personal. Taking the mark of the beast is a decision not to be taken lightly. Just as the first of the angels loudly spread the gospel, this one is giving a warning to the culture. The answer is not in the world. There are eternal consequences. If you take this mark, if this is a decision, Eve, and, and, and we learn about hell. Now, we think today it's a lot different, right? For apostate Christians today, you can get the best of both worlds. You don't have to worry about it. You can be a Laodicean. You can, you no. Know. The, the, the answer is still there. You have to make a decision one way or the other. Jesus said in Matthew 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say on that day, Lord, Lord, but didn't we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. And I'll declare to, declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Just as the fallen angels had a decision to make, and they could not undo that decision. Here, at this point in world history, when there's the choice of taking the mark or not taking the mark, the decision is undoable. Once you make that decision, you can't cross back. It's over with. Anyone who makes that decision has made a decision in favor of eternal damnation. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to mix, mix the words. It, it, there are too many people today who say, no, hell's not real, and, and, and it's not eternal. No, it is. It's very real. Jesus talked more about it than anything else in, in regards to it. He, he's the one who talked about it in terms that talked about it burning and never going out. 
He also said in Matthew 10, 28, don't fear those who can kill the body but are unable to kill the soul. Fear him who can destroy the soul and body in hell. And notice the torment where it takes place. In the very presence of the Lamb and his holy angels. That's something we didn't understand about hell. We now see. In Luke 12, 9, Jesus says that those who disown him before others will be disowned before the angels of God. And to suffer in the presence of the hosts of heaven is not to lessen the fierceness of the judgment, but to make it even more grievous. Stop and think about all the Christians who have been persecuted and killed in front of thousands. And those who did that will be persecuted in forever in front of the holy angels and in front of the Lord. And we stop and think about, oh, that can't be possible. Let me take you to Luke chapter 16 as a close here. In Luke chapter 16, we find out about this guy named Lazarus, and then there's this poor guy, a rich man, brother. Now the poor man died, and he was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. Okay, he's in torment, and he sees Abraham over there. And Lazarus, the beggar, in his, in, there, he's holding him. And he cries out and says, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I'm in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things and likewise Lazarus bad things? But now he's being comforted here and you're in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, there's a great chasm fix so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able and none can cross over from there to us. Okay? The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. The punishment of the damned who accept that mark, and I'm just being honest, that's what they are, is eternal. It's not a temporary measure. Anyone who makes that decision in favor of that mark is making an eternal decision in favor of damnation. And it's never going to stop. Never will. Jesus talks about it. He talks about it being eternal. He talks about it, there's 12 times in the New Testament he talked that hell's talked about. Jesus talks about it 11 times. He warned us more of hell than anyone else in the New Testament. And for the believer, the one who chooses not to follow the beast, yeah, you won't be able to buy food, you, you'll be actively hunted, you'll be placed in concentration camps, you'll be killed, but you'll spend eternity with Christ. For those who take the mark, for three and a half years, yeah, you'll be able to eat. But that's not much of a consequence. Then we, we see the final two verses, you lean up to chapter 14, verses 13. Here's the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from the heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors and their deeds follow with them. Martyrdom is the rule of the day for a believer. For those who refuse to take the mark, it's martyrdom, period. That's what it is. By the way, this is the second of seven blessings in the book of Revelation. This is a blessing. Really? It's a blessing. That's what this is. And, that, and that's hard to wrap your, wrap your hands around. Because the first blessing is, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy. Heed the things that are rich in, and written in it, for the time is near. And the second blessing talks about those who die in the Lord are blessed. What a, what's happened from that first one to read it and take heed to, okay, you're here because you didn't heed something, but you're going to heed it now. Today's message was in the book of Revelation. Pastor Ken has been teaching from this prophetic book here on the Unsafe Bible. You hear often about people trying to predict the end of the world or referring to some kind of apocalyptic event. But the truth is, the real apocalypse or revelation of Jesus Christ is something unlike anything else. If you know Jesus, you see these events as something that God will bring about to eventually restore things to how they were meant to be. If you view God as an enemy, you would naturally perceive the events in Revelation as some foreign enemy seeking to wreak havoc on the world and bring it to ruin. So what's the truth? 
If you're curious about what we believe and what our core foundation is built on, go to theunsafebible.com to learn more. Are you in the Jupiter, Florida area? If so, you're welcome to join us for these types of teachings in person. You'll find ways to contact us on our website so you can learn when and where we meet each week. You can also access more teachings online by going to theunsafebible.com and looking under the media tab. Catch up on any messages you've missed or listen to one you already heard as a refresher. Once again, that's theunsafebible.com. We're so glad you took the time today to hear from God and His Word. Pastor Ken has more to share from the book of Revelation, so don't miss a single edition. In the meantime, continue growing on your own in this very peculiar book of the Bible. And join us again on The Unsafe Bible.